it's indeed a privilege for me while being in service to be able to address a gathering in the plenary hall of the Vigyan Bhavan which I used to see only when I used to study and write for the IS exam. The fact that I got into it in 1981 of course is history but what is important is what have I learnt in the meanwhile and more important to address the subject of today. This session is devoted to debate on the protection of constitutional rights of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Honorable former Chief Justice and my colleague, senior colleague Mr. Krishnan have spoken some very good thoughts about them. Honorable Justice Balakrishnan spoke about amendment in the section article 243D which for the first time brought in reservation for the village level panchayats. That was quite interesting and I did experience it when I went to my own village and in my own village the Pradhan was from the SC community. So it did feel better to be in the village. The fact that he was not very strong by himself may have played a part in his getting elected. That is also an issue. I will tell you why, why I am making this particular point when we talk of civil rights or production of civil um, SCST rights. Today we are having a session right now the most important part of the session. I do not know out of the 1081 parliamentarians and legislators of this country, 175 MPs and 906 legislators, how many are present here? I doubt even if 1% are here. Why am I making this point? I am not making it for sarcasm. Why I am making is, we have no business to ask for rights when we cannot fight for them. If we got our rights, if Baba Sahib gave us rights, he fought for them. He didn't give, get them for free. There are no free lunches in the universe. And if the people are not ready to sacrifice, they have no business to seek any rights. Even Darwin said, survival of the fittest. Why did he say that? You have to fight for your survival. I'm not even talking of merit. I'm only talking of struggle. Unless you struggle, thou shalt not get. With that preface, and I don't hold just the legislators or the parliamentarians about this. I hold myself, my own self, and my brother colleagues from the bureaucracy equally and more viciously responsible for their act of omission and commission. Having said that, I will speak on two broad parameters. One, on a subject which is very dear to me and that is the Atrocities Act and its latest amendment to 2015, which actually started somewhere in 2009 and was being debated at a certain fora in 2012, was part of that fora. There are two key amendments in that. One is a list of offences which for instance Mr. Krishnan just mentioned not having a moustache that was to the surprise not included as an offence when it came to an atrocity against an SC or an ST. There is a whole bunch of offences which have been included as part of section 13 and then we have the special codes. If we do not have the special codes in the districts today. Whose fault is it? Is it the fault of people like you who have hardly any rights sitting here? I don't think you can struggle and go out in the street. It is the legislators and the bureaucrats of this country who have to struggle and fight it out. But alas, we don't do it. Hence, I am not seeing in the near foreseeable future setting up of courts in the districts or even appointment of special prosecutors which is mentioned there for contesting the cases. I tried to do some research before coming here of course that has been part of my endeavor since 2012. 
I do not have data in this country to tell me what is the status of FIRs filed, charge sheet made, convictions done, either in the Human Rights Commission or in the National Crime Research Records Bureau. If anybody has them, I will apologize and be edified by such data. Why am I saying this? I am saying this because there is one fundamental thing, whether we may struggle or not struggle, but at least let us try to come together to get information about our rights. What are the violations? Where are they progressing? If we can try to assimilate them, that will be a great help by itself. And then project it. I have tried to locate within the SCST National Commission report, the Central Caste Commission report, and so many reports. If you look at them, all, all these years, it's mentioned. The question is, there's hardly any action. So what am I going to discuss about protection of civil rights? Make blank statements about articles of the Constitution? Refer to sections in the Atrocities Act? I think the people sitting here in this plenary hall are mostly from urban areas. A few are certainly from the rural areas. I don't think they would hardly ever know. Of course, exceptions are always there. What it is to keep a moustache or wear a watch and not to keep a moustache and not wear a watch. I think it's very difficult. I would believe for myself as an administrator, while we have the social narrative, the most important thing is to have an economic narrative. I have been given two minutes starting now. I have a small presentation of 10 slides. I will try to finish it 10 seconds a slide. Can we have the presentation please? You see, this is a presentation about the economic empowerment of Dalits. I thought this is going to be something different. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. I, I want to look at my own notes. It's, it's a narrative, something which has not been discussed so easily. And I want and I believe that unless we have the economic power, something to which Justice Balakrishnan also alluded to, we will not have social power. And, and Ambedkar himself said, as you will see in the next slide, that history has shown that where ethics and economics come in conflict, the victory is always with economics. Western interests have never been known to have willingly divested themselves unless there was sufficient force to compel them. And hence, the need for an economic narrative. We are in jail, social and economic. 67% below the poverty line, 78% dropouts from school, 12% in college, less than 5% employed in dignified manner. And the basics of a dignified living not available to us. We are talking of two broad subjects, social empowerment, economic empowerment. We just spoke about the social empowerment. Mr. Mohinder Kumar, my colleague who is going to follow me, may also wish to elaborate on that. I would like to elaborate on the economic empowerment. We contribute to less than 2% of the GDP. You know what is the GDP size? 14 lakh crores as of 2016. There is something called a special component plan which has been much discussed in the planning commission, Niti Aayog, any form of bureaucracy or institutional framework in the country. I am giving you a figure of 2011-12 when it was last discussed in some bit of detail. The special component plan as mentioned in the plan document comprised 25,835.1 crores as 10% to 15% of the total allocation of the plan outlay. Now, where was it distributed? It was distributed in 318 schemes. And in what way? If there was an investment in Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in a boundary wall, it was apportioned. A part of the cost of that boundary wall is apportioned to the SC welfare. If there was Project Tiger, a part of it was apportioned to the scheduled caste welfare. Now, what I am trying to say is, we have paid more lip service, in fact, not even lip service, to what has been professed thanks to bureaucrats like me and the legislators and parliamentarians of this country. So, what do we have? In terms of certain basic needs, like electricity, we are only less than a third of the scheduled caste households have electricity. Less than 10% have sanitation. When we are the ones who provide sanitation to this country, we ourselves lack these facilities. We are not sanitation. Less than 20% have clean water. 
So, the point is, what are we at the end of the day? We are 50% of the agriculture wage labor. In fact, we are total of 61% of the wage labor in this country. And where are we confined? <coughs> the problem is not big as 29 states and 7 union territories. You focus on 5 states. UP, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar. My eminent colleague from Andhra Pradesh is here. You focus on these, you are looking at 10 crore of household population. And that is good enough to make a beginning. Beginning for what? Beginning for economic access, economic inclusion, economic participation, economic empowerment and economic sustainability. How do we do it? Here is a 360 degree approach. Empowered government, empowered parliament, empowered legal system, empowered institutions, empowered financial institutions and an action council for performance headed by the Prime Minister. Honorable President of India spoke about the underrepresentation in the judiciary. I will speak of the underrepresentation in the bureaucracy. Not more than 8% are in Group A posts of this country and probably less than 12% in Group B. I am the only scheduled caste secretary in the government of India. I am not going to have, this government is not going to have next year when I retire. There is hardly any scope for that. I am not here to criticize. But the point is, unless we understand these things, we will not be able to even ask for them. And those who are here can at least understand these things. Let me start with something more in detail. As I mentioned to you, the special component plan started in 1985 with a lot of fanfare and the concerned governments only paid lip service. I am not here to criticize governments. Let me talk of today. Financial year 17-18 has a budget outlay for schemes of 9.45 lakh crores. I am proposing that at least 15% of it, which is 1.5 lakh crores, should be made available to the scheduled caste year on year. What does that mean? What it means is, if you pick up 5 million scheduled caste every year, we can give them 12 lakhs per year out of this amount. You just divide it and you will find out the mathematics behind it. And now how do we do it? That is also very simple. We don't need to apportion it to Project Tiger. We don't need to apportion it to a boundary wall. We need to apportion it only to three or four things. This debate is already on, by the way. And the current government is looking at it very intently. I'm only just putting up some meat for debate. And number one, put three lakhs per person on quality education. We talk of right of education. I think that should be right to right education. I was mentioning, in fact, Mr. Atwal, Indar Atwal mentioned it to me the other day when he was in my room. I think that's a very important idea, right to right education. For your information, one of the most advanced, educationally advanced states in this country, according to a government report, 63.8% of class 8 students cannot pass class 2. The class 1 student cannot recognize figures from 1 to 9. This is government report. Go and check it, something called ASER. So it's not a question of right to education, it's a question of right to right education. I'm not saying that we must shut down the private schools. No, sir. You cannot progress by pulling a person out of the car who's traveling on it just because you're traveling on the road. What's needed is that you should get a car and travel on that road. We have to find way for that. And this is the way of getting 3 lakh rupees for quality education. 2 lakh rupees for health. How? Just give an insurance cover a premium of 10,000 rupees per year for 10 years. You have 1 lakh spent on it. And what do you get? You will get more than 50 lakh insurance coverage. Imagine huge coverage. Housing only one time. Skill development. If you look at the annual report of Ministry of Skill Development and Employment and Enterprise, you will not find special mention of the scheduled caste. There are 870 million youth of this country below 35 years which proud itself, which considers itself very proud of being a young nation. We have 200 million of us. I do not know where we are going to stand in terms of getting skilled. We have also a right to it. So how do we do it? First of all, set up a scheduled caste development bank. Start off with a corpus of 10,000 crores. And there's something which was started in March 2012, the MSME Procurement Act. Even today, 
Out of the 4% which was promised, I doubt if we are able to cover even 0.4%. So what am I suggesting? I am suggesting a very high level action council. I am not even suggesting a task force. I am suggesting an action council. I am not even suggesting a committee. I don't want any committees. I have seen enough committees in 37 years of my IAS. We want action and this action can be held at the highest level with the participation of the highest ranking people in the sector. Just two more slides, my friend. And this is slot by slot what, what can be done. Empowered education and skill, empowered financial institutions, empowered government and judiciary, empowered parliament, empowered institutions of the entire country. For example, take the parliament. Why can't we have one day in a fortnight just discussing on the SC and ST issues, whatever it is? Why? In a session, parliament session of one month or one and a half month, probably you'll have to do it only on two days. Why can't we do that? Why can't we, for instance, have a, a, slow, a, a, a target which tells us that 15% of the GDP should be produced by the SEs of this country? Honorable Justice Balakrishnan mentioned about our right in the uh, domestic product or the wealth of the country, I think that is the target which we can work at. And I am of the firm belief that if we are able to look towards that, maybe start planning for it from today, we can reach it in say 10 to 15 years time. All we have to do is get these 174 parliamentarians, 96 legislators and a thousand no good blokes like me and others and, and to take some steps. Please remember, any community that feels oppressed needs to take ownership of their own struggle. More importantly, they need to take ownership of their own solutions. If they don't, they have no business to ask for any rights. And can we start tomorrow?